Hey, Wikipedians. Good morning, everybody. How are you doing? Or shall I say Wikipedians and tech at state aficionados? Welcome, you guys. Thank you so much for joining us today um, here at George Washington University. So pleased to have you with us um, for the State Department's Tech at State on wiki.gov. Um, no better partner than uh, Wikimania and all of the partners here, all the participants here to help us make this really a dynamic discussion today. So thank you. My name is Suzanne Fillion. I work in the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs at the State Department, and I will be your MC today. Feel free to throw tomatoes, throw wikis, whatever you want to throw. So before we kick it off uh, with our opening discussions, I'm just going to give, get through a few um, items. Really want to thank our massively helpful partners who, who make sure that this is as streamlined as possible. Um, one of the reasons that we're not in the State Department, I got to say, is that it's so much more fun to be online and be able to tweet while we're here. And you know, government firewalls kind of get in our way sometimes. So we are extraordinarily thankful to uh, George Washington for once again um, allowing us to play in their space. Um, absolutely. I also want to shout out again uh, the Wikipedia Foundation and the Wikimania 2012 Program Committee. I've seen some amazing t-shirts in the last 30 minutes or so, and I'm just embarrassed to be standing up in, here in front of you guys with a dress on and not something a little bit more entertaining. Um, and, you know, George Washington, we've shouted out extensively. Finally, I really want to thank Metro Star Systems. They've been our partner for several of the past uh, tech at states and are so helpful in making this sort of a, um, a before, during, and after, um, you know, rich digital experience for everybody. So thank you. Um, you guys, we're, we're going to be here for the remainder of the day in this auditorium. The lounge is on the third floor. I know a lot of you have already been here over the course of the morning for the amazing discussions over at Wikimania, but just to make sure. That's where you'll find the refreshments um, and be able to network with everybody in this room and, and participating in the other conference over the course of the day. Um, there will be an unconference tomorrow, so check out online for um, some instructions on that. It will be in the Betts Theater as well, so you need not look for a new venue. Um, and if you need help, this is the part that I love the most, most. We're the government and we're here to help. My amazing colleagues in the Office of E-Diplomacy from the State Department who run, strategize, organize, make Tech at States happen um, are here with us. Um, and not only are we the people wearing dresses and suits, uh, you can also identify my colleagues in the E-Diplomacy office. They'll have an orange stripe on the bottom of their tag. Please do ask them if you need any kind of assistance. Um, they're here to help you out. Is everybody already on Wi-Fi hands? OK, cool. For those of you who are not, um, it's GW underscore event. Um, the user is wiki12, case sensitive, all uppercase, so wiki12. And the password is wi12ki. So hit me up after or one of us, and we'll help you out if you have any um, problems logging on. Um, you know, perhaps the most important part is that we are you know, here together in this auditorium. We are also joined by a significant online audience. So I do want to shout out everybody who's tuning in via the live stream. Um, and we really want you to be part of this discussion. We're going to be, um, I hope we've got a lot of folks in the audience today who will be live tweeting. Uh, we ask that you please use the hashtags that you see up here. So Tech at State and Wikimania, if you still are within the 140 character space. Uh, we want that discussion to be a dynamic one. And I always find it helps to kind of log what the discussions are for afterwards when we're kind of bragging and showing off to colleagues and friends. Uh, we will be also welcoming any questions and thoughts from the online audience. My colleague Bob will be sharing those over the course of our panels um, and discussions a little bit later. So rock out with your bad selves online audience. Thanks for tuning in. Um, so without further ado, um, let me introduce Beth Simone Novick. I think that there's nobody better uh, to kick us off today for Tech at State uh, on wiki.gov. Uh, Beth has distinguished herself in, in both academia and the, the private sector in so many um, capacities. And so it's a difficult bio to summarize. Uh, but let me just highlight a couple of, of elements for those of you who don't know Beth already. She's a professor of law and has served in the White House as United States Deputy Chief Technology Officer. She was there from 2009 to 2011, so no stranger to DC. And she led the White House Open Government Initiative, as most of you know, at OpenGov, very well known. Um, and as a result of these efforts, now every department and agency um, has an open government plan that outlines specific and innovative commitments to create more effective government. Um, perhaps most importantly for the sake of this, of this conversation today, Beth is the author of a book I'm sure most of you kind of keep by your bedside table. Um, so Wiki Government, How Technology Can Make Government Better, Democracy Stronger, and Citizens More Powerful. 
Awesomely, this book is available already, Arabic, Chinese, Russian. You can find it on Kindle. And we're so pleased to have you here today, Beth. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. This is, uh, that should be working. So thank you to Suzanne, and thank you to Chris, and to Tim, and to the whole Office of E-Diplomacy for having me here today. Uh, my excuse is that I generally wear a t-shirt and flip-flops now as an academic, uh, so I dusted off my old suit today and got to put it on for you, at least for the State Department side of the room, if not for the Wikimania side of the room. Um, but I am really excited here uh, to be here today to talk about my favorite topic, which is that of wiki government, which is that of how we create more distributed, decentralized, co-created government where citizens and institutions work together to create effective forms of governance. This is obviously an idea which is, I think, long overdue. It's no stranger to anybody in this room, the news that trust in government is at an all-time low. And this is no longer, of course, just a Washington phenomenon. It is a global phenomenon that is exploding all around the world is we have this lack of faith in our traditional institutions, be they government, be they media, be they religious organizations. This is, there is a pervasive sense that our institutions are failing us in terms of their ability to be effective at solving problems, and in this space, at performing the work of governance. Well, what's sort of the core of the problem? To my mind, what government is actually supposed to do is to channel the flow of two things, values and expertise to the end of two government and two citizens and back and forth to the end of helping us to make decisions. Well, the way that we've designed this process is on the one hand a fairly 18th century model, which is that of voting as a way of channeling the flow of values. But in the day and age of social media, and I don't know if I dread or uh, anticipate favorably what's going on in the back channel right now, we have a way to express ourselves much more directly, maybe perhaps too directly. We layer on top of this the 19th century model of bureaucracy as a way of coordinating and centralizing the flow of expertise. But we know, again, by looking not only around this room, but looking around the virtual room that is part of this conference and elsewhere, that expertise is widely distributed in society, not just in any one centralized institution. So the question is, how do we think about redesigning practically today, how do we think about actually opening up the way that institutions work? In the first place, and what I want to focus on today, is to make our institutions smarter, to make them smarter and more intelligent and to have better access to information than we do today. Well, I'll go back to that experience of being in the White House back in 2009 when I first came on the day after, the day of the inauguration. Remember, it was freezing cold, and we went in to warm up after the inauguration, and we wanted to start an open government initiative. We wanted to ask the question of how do we change the way the government works. Let's do it first by asking government employees what their advice is. This had never been done before, to ask rank and file people, not agency heads, but rank and file employees what they thought. We then thought next, well, we should actually ask the public about how to formulate an open government policy, what that might look like, not after we'd written the policy in the way that's typical with a rule or other policy in DC, but before the fact. Many people told us this was not only impossible, there was no technical precedent, no cultural precedent, but no legal precedent, and it might even be illegal to do this. So the question was, what were the ways in which, or the question remains, what are the ways in which we could actually get people to engage so that we could create smarter institutions that are better informed in the way that they work, that allow us to find, recognize, and implement new ideas, not just to generate innovations, but to actually implement innovations and take them to scale so that we can have better and more effective government. Well, one way in which we've begun, one model in which we've begun to, to engage with people and create opportunities for participation is through the opening up of data and asking geeky people to do stuff with that data through hackathons, through mashathons, through data paloozas, and other events that give people a concrete way of engaging with government, using government data to actually build tools that for greater social benefit. In this case, the example is of the many, many Health 2.0 tools 
that are being built on top of the community health data initiative, open government data that's being put out by the Department of Health and Human Services and others to now drive towards better wellness and better healthcare outcomes. But if we actually talk about a more collaborative process of how do we actually get data in from people, how do we think about the wiki way of crowdsourcing more kinds of information, not just getting people to clean data or to build apps on, part, on top of the data, but to source that data, this turns out to be a very hard and un, I think unexplored territory yet. We're currently working on a project that we call Orgpedia, which is, you know, uh, modestly the way we think about this is trying to create a Wikipedia of firms trying to think about opening up the data that governments hold and others hold about the companies that are regulated by government. Who are those companies, where are they, who owns them, and who do they own? Basically a directory of firms. Not a necessarily impossible task, but it turns out all the data that we might want in order to help regulators target enforcement better, in order to help economists do research, in order to help in journalists do investigations and, frankly, in order to decrease the regulatory burden on firms, not all of that data is going to sit within government databases. It's going to have to be crowdsourced and contributed by the public to enable us in a wiki way to actually get at the data about who firms are, public and private and globally. So I raise this as just an example of what I like to think of as the hybrid wiki. The wiki that includes both government data, so-called authenticated government data, and user-contributed data yet. And we're just beginning, I think, to try to figure out what the models are that will allow us to combine information from different sources. Because right now we have a fairly, let me call it, fetishized view of government data, its sanctity, its authenticity, its integrity, and therefore a fear, frankly, of crowdsourcing, of engaging people and contributing information in new ways that could actually help all of us to become smarter, whether within government or within society. So government data, in a way, is the Encyclopedia Britannica of yesterday. And now we have to think about how we move from Britannica to Wikipedia, how we move from government data to hybrid wikis to combine data that would allow us to get much, much smarter whether it's about who companies are, whether it's about the environment or transportation or any one of the issues that we care about. One of the ways in which, in areas in which we've made a lot of progress in government in opening up the way that we work is through the adoption of social media. It's helped us to start the conversation between institutions and the public in new ways that we haven't explored before, and that's beginning to change the relationship between the public and the state. We're starting to use new kinds of tools, whether it's petition sites like these or the many, many brainstorming sites which are now in use in government in the last few years as a way of generating new innovations and generating new ideas. So this is now, again, beginning the conversation about how we open up and decentralize and create more collaborative co-creation of government than before. But crowdsourcing has its limits. What well, gets done in places like this in Washington, in the places where policies, where decisions are made, are actually very, very complicated. This is something I pulled off of the Federal Register yesterday on pelagic shelf rockfish. Uh, it turns out it probably is pretty hard to answer the question about uh, prohibited, whether one should prohibit fishing for pelagic shelf rockfish in Alaska in a 140 character tweet. It's hard to do policy making purely with social media, which are not ideally suited in their design to making law, to making regulation together. So we need new ways of going beyond the traditional models of crowdsourcing. Both in the UK now and in the state of Texas, they have explored the use of, of web tools to enable people, for example, to identify opportunities for deregulation. In the Texas case, deregulating professions, and in the UK case, more generally, how to deregulate government more extensively. But again, the tools are very useful for saying, I hate this rule, get rid of this rule, but very hard to take the next step of going beyond simply crowdsourcing an idea to what I like to think about as crowdsourcing implementation. If we're going to get rid of a rule, if we're going to think about how to deal with pelagic rock shellfish in Alaska, then we need to also get data. 
We need to know what the examples are. We need to know what it's going to cost. We need to know what the alternatives are. We need to know how to do the implementation. We need to know what pilot projects we might create. There's the work that people do around this room to actually implement policies and take them to scale that requires a lot more than we can do with the tools that we're currently using. Some of these impediments are social and some of them are technical. So we have begun to explore, let me go back to this for a second, the use of crowdsourcing and particularly the use of wikis as new ways, more comprehensive, more expansive ways of doing things like writing policy and like writing laws and writing regulations. But it turns out it's not so easy just to throw up a tool and have it work. This is an example of the wiki that was started, if you will, by Reddit to essentially try to crowdsource the writing of alternative legislation to SOPA and PIPA. Well, this is a lot of I am not a lawyer, people trying to figure out how to outdo each other with the heretofores and the wheretofores and the, and the uh, uh, I'm trying to think of some of the awful language that I teach my students in law school, trying to get them to, talk, to write as complicated as they possibly can think uh, of doing because they're trying to figure out how do I actually write something in a way that will work as legislation. And in fact, the problem is, is that there's a disconnect here between the institutions of legislative drafting and the people with the know-how and the wherewithal and the passion to actually work on the topic. Without any involvement from the institutional side, you get products that get drafted that end up not being usable. So I stole some slides from folks with their permission at Wikivote uh, to just show you an example of a re some recent experiments coming out of Russia. I don't know what the success has been or what, how, where to think about them, but I wanted to share them with you of the use of wikis now in Russia to crowdsource the drafting of legislation, not by simply throw, quote unquote, throwing up a wiki, but by engineering social practices that will allow the public to actually engage in doing the draft. Play with and experiment and evolve towards new tools but more importantly, more cultural, better cultural practices that actually allow us to think about how we might crowdsource the drafting of policy as well as then the crowdsourcing of the sourcing of data and the building things on top of that data. This is, um, and so there are in the UK, uh, this is again another recent experiment that just is going on right now that's just about to launch which is again thinking about how do we modify a traditional wiki-based approach by trying also to combine it with sourcing, using new tools for identifying and sourcing experts so that we can make sure that we're inviting people to the party who can actually participate in drafting, uh, who can participate in policy-making processes who might not otherwise know about the opportunity to engage. I think there's a robust academic and public policy debate about whether we need to identify and source experts, whether we in fact should crowdsource from people who are non-experts using mechanical Turk style approaches uh, to uh, using the wisdom of the crowd but not necessarily seeking any specific expertise. There are great disagreements about what it means to be an expert and how to find expertise, but I think that's what's exciting about the time that we're at right now is that we have this chance to play with new ways of getting information from new kinds of people. This was really, in short, the thesis and the theory behind the work that we did with Wiki, uh, with Peer to Patent and that made its way into the story that became the Wiki government book. I can summarize it for you in 30 seconds so you can save on the book. The, well, here's what the book says. It says that people are smart. They can do more than just talk and they can do more than just vote once every year, once every four years. If we have institutions that ask people, that invite people, that create opportunities for people to participate and that do so based on their interests and expertise and passions, which may not be policy or politics. It may in fact not just not be patents. It may be on one particular issue relating to battery storage or software or business methods or solar power, whatever it may be, if we can create opportunities for people to participate according to their highest and best use, and we get institutions working with networks, not simply civil society by itself, not simply freestanding wikis, not connected to the worlds of decision making and 
is our political institutions, then we can design practices that will actually work practically for us to create and co-create governance in new ways. So Peer to Patent started uh, back in 2000, the idea started in 2005 and we implemented in 2007 a project to connect scientists and technologists to the United States Patent and Trademark Office to help patent examiners get the information that they needed, to help them become smarter about examining patents. I'm pleased to report that the Patent Office, we now, we did what we said we wanted to do, which was to put ourselves out of business with the idea, of, and now the U U.S. Patent Office this fall will be launching full-scale, complete, 100% crowdsourced participation on the examination of patents universally. It's, a, I think, a historic development and an important one in this step forward towards creating more participatory and more open institutions and for giving us a model for doing so. Let me close, this is Washington, so you can't close any talk without having a policy point at the end. Gotta have some policy bullets to have a talk um, in DC. And let me close with four suggestions of how we can move this ball forward. The first, of course, is legal. Right now, we do not have a legislative framework that supports the use of wikis or the support any kind of public engagement in the world of governance. We need to redo, reform, undo, if you will, the Federal Advisory Committee Act, which and now I'm gonna, just to be short, I'm gonna, I'm gonna oversimplify, but let me just say, we have a law called FACA, which makes it illegal to convene a group, and potentially to convene an online group or a network of people who are advising government. We have another law called the Paperwork Reduction Act, which makes it illegal after you convene that group to then ask them a question without the permission of OMB in a long period of review. We need a legal framework that will actually encourage the use of citizen engagement and online citizen engagement. We need policies that mandate collaboration, whether it's the gathering of information and its collection, the cleaning of information, the checking of information, its analysis, or drafting of laws and policies. We have to actually mandate the use of engagement so that it is relevant to and embedded in the practices of institution. We cannot expect people in the wiki community, we cannot expect the online wider world to participate and to use and give of their time and intelligence and expertise and passion if no one is going to listen and if it isn't going to be relevant to how policies are made, decisions are taken, and money is spent. And finally, we have to begin to experiment more with the tools that we have. We have to think about the hybrid wiki. We have to think about the GitHub for lawmaking. We have to think about the ways in which we can adapt the wiki environments and collaborative environments that we've created in order to allow us to make government together. Look, ultimately, why does Wikipedia work? Why are we all here and to celebrate the model of wikis? They work because they give us a concrete, real model for a way to engage. We don't have that yet for government. We don't know yet what it means to participate and to co-create the practices of governments. But I would submit if we begin to change the law, if we change the policy and we play with the tools, we might have a pathway forward that allow us the next time we meet to celebrate the true creation of wiki government. Thank you. So guys, we're going to start taking questions, um, and uh, would like to definitely take some from the online audience. Thanks to everybody who's been tweeting. Um, can I see some hands? Just to, who would be the first volunteer for Beth? Yes, right here. No surprise on this one. So I'm Scott Smith from E Diplomacy. Uh, loved your presentation. Uh, I was initially skeptical about innovation in government until I discovered that there were lots of innovative individuals and over time have concluded that we will win because we're networked. Uh, the, the comment that I would have here is, is there, or the question, is there a venue or a way in which we can be networked around this vision and the goals that you set out? Uh, maybe a discussion? Do you have an answer to your own question first? I suspect you do. I'd like to hear it. Uh, we have been building and we support tools internally within the State Department. Uh, it is a subset of the broader audience that ought to participate in the, in the conversation. So let me ask you a question back, if I might, uh, or to, to everyone. Here's the dilemma. Here's one of the dilemmas around this topic. Two, two, two dilemmas, I think. One is 
One is I think we still haven't crystallized the way of talking and thinking about the vocabulary, the imagery for this. Right now, government is a pretty bad word. Democracy is a boring word, maybe. Um, you know, we need, better, we need better vocabulary, and then we don't have agreement necessarily on what's the pathway to innovative. So you talk about innovative government and effective government, everybody likes that, but the, the argument that's at the root of this, that open and collaborative is the way to get to better and more effective innovation, I don't think is an argument that we've sold to the world very well yet. So half of this is like a, is a marketing thing. Um, so I would put that out there. The second is, is that you know, government is a very kind of horizontal topic. The thing we found with doing the Peer to Patent Project, there are patent watchers, there are USPTO watchers, there are people who care about uh, patents. I've worked on regulations.gov. There are people who care about regulations. Those are not normal people. Those are people who live in Washington or who practice law. Um, but the rest of the world cares about crime and the environment and education and whatever it is that they care about that they do in the, they're the passions in their day-to-day -day life. So we talked years ago about getting rid of silos in government and, uh, and I wonder whether we have fully finished that job and there isn't a way, so my, this is a long-winded question back to you, because I'm not sure, because I don't have an answer, but because I, I think the question is how do we actually sync up what we do which has a whole lot of acronyms uh, and just cuts this way and appeals to an audience of people who are follow the Beltway or its equivalent in other countries with what people actually care about in their day to day in, to engage people in that co-creation process. And let me, let me maybe I'll just end by um, the, the question with, because I, I do want to mention this. There's a wonderful man who passed away this year by the name of Roger Kennedy. He was the former head of the National Park Service. He was the former head um, of the American Museum of History. And he wrote a wonderful book called When Art Works, about the use of art and imagery to engage people in and, and become passionate about the New Deal around the time of Roosevelt. And I mention him both because he was a dear friend and I, and I want to mention his important contribution to thinking about these issues, which is to say, we lack the thing to get passionate about, the thing that will convene us. He said, I, when I ran the National Park Service, everybody loves their park, and nobody thinks about the fact that that is government. So I would ask you, what is the equivalent of the park, of the national park, that could get us engaged and networked around topics rather than perhaps around institutions? Answers, comments, questions? And I'm going to be brief for Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Yuri Borovsky. I'm from Ukraine. I'm a student of public diplomacy or person graduate. And my question revolves around the question of identity. And I think a lot of what you're talking about here will have to stretch out on online identity and sort of verifying it and things like this are already being in works in Estonia, I believe, where they have the digital identification card. America doesn't have anything like this. In fact, this is the country where uh, you can prove your identity with your billing address, which can be your friend's address. I mean, like, um, as a Ukrainian, I've been very amazed how Real, 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 uh, how easy it is in this country. So when you get on the internet, uh, you know, are, how are you just going to work in this in this country, where um, you know you have the voting processes uh, to register for voting elections? How are you going to try to like bring this online? How are you going to you know? And online, I mean, as we know, people online are sort of this anonymity kind of uh, culture right now. So how are this cultural transformation and technological transformation with identity is going to help bring into what you're talking about here? It's a really important question. You know, we give our identities to Facebook, but we don't want to give them to the government. Um, and it'll be interesting to see whether our sensibilities and sensitivities change in this regard. I'm not sure that they will anytime soon, which is why technical solutions that are being developed around distributed identity management and identity authentication are kind of the interesting, promising next road. But as we think about how to do more crowdsourced or wiki-based or collaborative ways of working, we know, we know from at least the experience we've had that authentication and identity are crucial to help maintaining civility and productive conversation. So I think this is an important area for experimentation and research, and we have to see whether there's stomach for testing some of those boundaries. It'll be interesting to see also whether experiences in other countries um, where Latvia, for example, where they've been doing a lot on crowdsourced, uh, wiki-based legislative drafting, 
um, and that you have an identity management system in place for doing that, for authenticating who lives where. I think we have easy, we're going to have an easier job developing technical rather than cultural or legal solutions to some of these problems in the U.S. or to some of these opportunities in the U.S. Uh, uh, in, the, in the short term. I think. But it's an important, it's, an, it's another, imp uh, another important area for research. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jay Huey. I was just wondering to what extent, I, it's hard to look around Washington these days and not see successes in collaboration in social media and so forth, you know, the digital government strategy and mobility and so forth. I wonder to what extent those successes or partial successes are impeding the, the honest discussion of some of the challenges you mentioned. For, you know, some of that was new to me that there really are some more of these obstacles still to overcome. The successes are impeding discussion of the challenges. Well, that's why, you know, we, that's why you have to leave government and get, get out so you can talk about some of the challenges and why there is sort of a revolving door. In this case, I don't mean between agencies and lobbyists. I'm talking about between academia and government um, and just people who are, what's been so exciting about the move towards the greater adoption of tech and innovation, the, you know, the work of the Office of E-Diplomacy is that it has engaged so many people from outside of government or who are sitting at places like Rice University who can have open and honest conversations about what we need to do since often when you're within government, conversations tend to be driven by communications offices and framed by bullet points and message and memo and you know message of the day and all this stuff. Um, and it's not always the best place to have these kinds of complex conversations. So you're right that there, on the one hand, there has been some degree of rah-rah, but also there's, I would argue that there's also a need to be celebratory. I mean, half of the job I think that I did in open government was to talk about open government as much as possible until it became real. Because um, you gotta just keep pitching an idea, preferably an idea that's a little more aspirational where we're not there yet. So you gotta keep celebrating open data because we are so far away from actually achieving open data, even though to many of us in the space, it may seem like, oh yeah, open data, done that, what's next? Um, but th we've just scratched the tip of the iceberg. So I think, again, how to have the, I think that critical conversation can become from a lot of places, uh, whether it's from within, but having institutions be self-critical and be open to those conversations I think that's an important point. I, I've made this before is in other places, is that we have this enormous industry called the public sector that does almost nothing on reviewing and redoing its own business model and on engaging in that kind of self-criticism that is so typical for every business um, and all the consultants that they hire whose job it is to engage in that kind of self-criticism and self-awareness. Hi, thanks. It's really great to see the things you're doing. Um, but in the first uh, E-Town Hall meeting that President Obama had, the number one question that, that floated to the top was about marijuana legalization. And he was very dismissive of it. How do we get policymakers and our elected officials to respect the will and the interest of the online community? The question is whether after the events of this year, after SOPA PIPA, uh, any politician would dare not to pay attention right now. I think there are a lot of politicians who woke up this year and said, after SOPA PIPA, after Coney, after Planned Parenthood, after the various kind of grassroots net activism uh, uprisings that have occurred this year, who have said, Get me a briefing on that internet thing. Tell me what those people think, because uh, I better start paying attention. I mean, there was a kind of, you know, there's been a Netroots uh, blogging community that's been very vocal and active and a powerful force in shaping politics over the last 10 years already. But I think our collective interest as netizens is just beginning to be recognized as a force. And I think it's going to come just from more experiences like that where people will uh, where mainstream parties and politicians will realize that they need to start taking notice because it can, it's a force that cannot be ignored. 
I also think that for us, it was a chance to feel our own sense of community, our own sense of muscle, our own sense of ability. And we're seeing lots of activities now in people trying to figure out where do we, what direction do we take this now and in what ways can we use our power as a collective force of netizenship to have and express political voice as an alternative to the traditional pathways of influence. So, I have an online We'll, we'll probably laugh five years from now about you know, that town hall meeting in the way that now we can laugh when we say, it was 2008 when we had the first blog in the federal government. It now seems a very long time ago, I hope. But. Suzanne? Uh, um, to kind of continue on that, um, I was just wondering what kind of changes do you foresee uh, occurring to both the structures of our government and our society as we evolve our ability to communicate and adapt to an environment of free-flowing information. It is, so, how many hours do we have? That's like, Sorry. you know. I apologize. Take my class at NYU. I think that's gonna be the, I'm gonna have you as a guest speaker. That's like the whole topic of the class. Um, it's a great term paper question. Um, do you want to grade some term papers? That's a good idea. Uh, you know, what is the future evolution of the world look like and of democracy? Uh, let me try to think, it, let me see if I can take off a little, uh, I'll take a small chunk of that in the interest of time, uh, hiding my own ignorance. Um, I think the evolution for me looks like two things. One is the initial wave of the evolution towards more collaborative uh, uh, and open democracy is this smarter government idea. It's more ways of making our institutions smarter. I mean, it makes no sense now that we have, I mean, half of the lobbying problem is not the, let me digression here, is not, the, not just the money in politics problem and money buying influence. It's the fact that we actually need and depend on lobbyists as the way we get information in the legislature. We don't have a, an advisory or information function to make the people we have entrusted with making decisions smart. That's what lobbyists do, and many of them do a very good job at that. They're like the good lobbyists, and then they're the evil lobbyists. And the good ones, i.e. those people with whom we agree on whatever causes we care about, are the people whose job it is to go to Washington and tell legislatures of their important issues that they should care about. It's crazy that we don't have an advisory function like that. It's crazy that when you sit in the White House, you don't have a way to enlist a network of people quickly. You know, if I go on Stack Exchange tomorrow and post a question, I can get an answer to a question in how many seconds does it take? You know, 10 seconds, 15 seconds to get a response. And not only can I get one response, I can get four responses so quickly. So I think the first evolution is in structures and tools that make our institution smarter, whether it's the legislative branch, the judicial branch, or the executive branch. I think that's gonna be the first wave that's gonna come before to some extent in parallel, but, but before real kind of devolution of power over decision making or spending or any kind of new funky you know, structures. But I think in the very first place, the, the opportunity we are missing is to just get smart together. We need Wikipedia like mushed up with government and then, I don't know, I need a term for the well. Oh, wiki government. Yeah, that would be the term for that. And then the world will be a better place. Okay. Who is the young lady? Where is the bike there? there That's is. me. Okay. I'm Julie, and I represent a small business uh, IT company that provides services for the government. And while I think the conversation is great, one of my questions is, um, how are you going to upset the challenges of every single individual, every single company, every single group, bring, their, bring in their own ad agenda to the discussion? How are you going to really separate just loud conversation with real minim meaningful discussion? Right. So I think it's why, to come back to the earlier question, as between sort of fixing the question of how we uh, better affect the representation of values versus expertise, I think expertise is the easier problem to solve first because it involves less shouting, number one. Number two, it's not fixing how we get expertise is less about hearing everybody's voice than hearing the important ideas and range of ideas on a given topic. And that's not, any particular topic isn't going to interest everybody. You're going as a small business owner in IT, you might have an interest on specific technology issues, you may have a particular interest on education because you have a kid, or you may have an interest in 
whatever, space exploration because it's your hobby, whatever it may be, it may be the area in which you want to get involved, and the five people sitting next to you have no interest in getting involved at all. So again, it's not about crowdsourcing widely and hearing from everybody, it's about crowdsourcing wisely in ways that we can get better ideas from people, number one. Number two, we can use the design of the processes we create to actually try to dampen down the noise level and create more productive conversation. What happened in the peer-to-patent pilot, and again, this was a small project, not a big one, is that by using openness and by letting people rate and rank each other's contributions, we were able to minimize any kind of abusive process. We also, like and inspired by Wikipedia, we didn't ask people, what's your view of this patent? We asked people, we're looking for specific bibliographic information after date X that is responsive to what this examiner needs to know about the patent application, in, in short. And so by framing the questions, by giving people a clear idea of how to participate, you engender better and more effective participation and you're able to exclude a lot of the noise. One of the things we did when we created the online forum for the Open Government Initiative and invited the public to participate was we were able, again, legally and technically to define what was on topic for the conversation and to use the tools, in that case a WordPress blog, to minimize and shrink any, top, any comments that were off topic, allowing the conversation to flow naturally by virtue of the rating of the people in the conversation. Anyway, long story short, I think there are ways that are both cultural and technical that we can experiment with to create more on-topic conversations. I think there are ways of asking questions that are going to appeal to narrower groups of people and to elicit expertise from them, rather than trying to tackle the much harder problem of how we talk about our shared and collective values, for which I think our institutions are still uh, quite well designed and robust. Okay, uh, thanks. I think you answered this question that we got online uh, just now, which was why are there no checks and balances in your system but only an un unelected flash mob? Uh, I think that you may have just answered that question. You want to do, I, I'm, the lights are mine so I can't see the voice of the internet. Is that you, Chris, from somewhere? No, you're here, but where's the voice of the internet coming from? Um, if you want to maybe read off two or three questions, and then we can... Just okay, them there's the, this um, one. I'm Bob Watts from the Office of E-Diplomacy. I'm reading the questions online. Oh, there you are. So there is, why are there no checks and balances in your system, but only a, an unelected flash mob? And then from uh, our Office of Art and Embassies at the State Department, discussing Robert Kennedy's book, When... Uh, when art works, what do you think? Do we need to rally around arts like we do national parks? Uh -huh. um, so I think to the first point, let me make clear that I'm not talking about, I'm not prescribing a system or a worldview in terms of the replacement of current institutions. I'm talking about, I hope, ways of creating uh, auxiliary capacity for current institutions, using the network, if you will, to make current institutions smarter in the way that we're now using social media and that we're beginning to use other tools to make the institutions that we have smarter. So, and again, the peer to patent system was not designed to replace the patent office. It was not designed to replace the examiner or the decision making of the examiner, quite the opposite. The examiner was the final decision maker. And so we had the check and the balance of the crowd policing each other and then the examiner and the institution policing the crowd and then being policed by the crowd. So we had a kind of nice interplay that created opportunities for checks and balances. The Roger Kennedy um, idea, I do think that art and imagery and language uh, and music and whatever it takes, if we need a schoolhouse rock for wiki government, if we need pictures, if we need words to help us get excited about the project of government again, um, I mean, there's something that's drawing more people to participate than ever before, people to show up to a conference about wikis and tech government. Um, it's, I think, inspiring and heartening, but we want to try to spread that movement of civic-mindedness, uh, I think, far and wide. And maybe, you know, Roger's right that if people care about their park or their school, they don't ever have to know that that's government. They don't ever have to think about it as government um, so long as it creates a way for them to engage and provide opportunities to participate um, and to lend of their expertise and their know-how and their passion. 
So I think, but I think that we should not limit our conversation to that of law or policy or even tools. We want to think about the expressive and the emotive and the ways that we create incentives for people to participate. Let's take one final question from here. We've heard you guys yet. The left Did side of the room. Hi, my name is Eduardo Testart. I'm from Chile. I'm very interested about this. Uh, I was thinking if you thought about the, uh, the subject of releasing public information. Um, I believe this country, correct me if I'm wrong, you don't have a federal identification, you have the passport, for example. Uh, inside, if you're in Tennessee, they give you a, a, an ID in Tennessee, or if you're in California, it's like that. Um, I'm thinking how, how would this country deal with the subject of releasing public information? I don't know if there's a centralized civil registry where you can ask a birth certificate. For example, in Chile, anyone with a date and a, a name can ask for a birth certificate. Uh, when you build uh, public buildings, there is a bidding for constructors which anyone can check. Can this country deal with the exposure of public information released? I think it's kind of related also with the budgets. My salary, it's public. I work for the government. Anyone can check it. I don't know. If it's a subject to address, I don't know. So very briefly, uh, putting to one side the identity issue and the federal versus state nature of how we authenticate citizenship in this country, um, which, which is a combination of the two, we do have and we're the first to have a national data portal to begin to open up open government data. Chile has been very far uh, very progressive also in the, in the world of opening up government data, um, which engenders a conversation about spending and about roadworks and about environment and all kinds of things. So we do have a national data portal. There are areas, though, in which um, uh, most of that work around open government data, whether in this country or in others, has been sort of to put up online whatever we can quickly. And now I think there's an effort to think about how to prioritize some of what's put up. The issue I mentioned before with Orpedia, which is particular to the US, in other countries you have a centralized corporate registry where you can go and look up, in Chile, tell me the name, I want to look up company X, tell me the records of that company. And it's much easier, but you, what you can't get is a bulk download of all the companies. Or you can't get a download of all the companies, for example, all the nonprofits in the country, so that you could create a tool that would let you figure out who's offering homelessness services and who's offering educational services and where and who's served and who's not served or in the business community, I can't create, I can't download bulk data that would allow me to figure out who has the most environmental violations mashed up against their labor violations. So there are areas in which I think we need to start exploring the creation of larger scale collaborative data serving portals, but particularly to stick to the, to, to bring it back to the topic of this conversation, where we need to tie that into conversations and communities and collaboration for filling in gaps in data, for examining and analyzing data, and for building tools on top of that data in order to generate insights and develop innovations. The data is great, but it's the data when, with a lot of eyeballs looking at it and having a conversation about it that then transforms it into improvements in how institutions work. So I'm glad you asked the question that because data is an essential part, I think, of the conversation about where wikis can take us, the combination of the two, I think, is quite powerful. Liz and Beth, we want to thank you so much for such an incredible presentation. Can everybody join me in thanking Beth? We realize for the moment that the revolving door has you in New York, but we can't wait for you to get back here.